let me say hello, everyone. Hopefully you're now able to see me. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of people saying that's better now that they can see me. I apologize for that. Thank you, everyone. My name is Darius Doe. Again, I am an alumni relations specialist. I am delighted to be with you all this evening. And we have a fabulous program in store for you. This is the third part of our three-part financial health webinar series. Our first part focused on the basic or beginning stage with Dr. Fadija Rashid. And then the second part was mid-career stage with Stephanie. And this third part is focusing on retirement. That was Stephanie Summers for the second part. And so this is the retirement and beyond stage for this evening. And we have Stephen Leibach with us who is in fact himself a Gallaudet alumni, class of 85, got a graduate degree from New York University, NYU. And we are so thrilled for him to bring information to share and present to us directly communicated in American Sign Language. So with all of that said, I will now turn it over to Steven. Let me actually spotlight Stephen to make sure that people are able to see him. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Darius. Sure. Well, I'm going to turn my video off and the floor is yours. Sounds I will great. also open up your PowerPoint presentation. Okay. While the PowerPoint's opening, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Stephen Leibach, and I am in the financial field. I've been in this field for 35 years now. During that time, I've worked closely with many individuals who have financial needs and other questions that need answered. So tonight, an honor to present at Gallaudet. It's really an honor to be here. And I'm so happy to share my diverse experience with all of you who are joining today and able to watch the webinar. So tonight, let's talk about what we are going to be discussing. This is for those that are nearing retirement age. As retirement grows ever closer, it's very important that we consider the life change that it represents. After one third of your life has been put into education, the other half of your life put into your career. And that last bit of that stage is what we're going to talk about today. It's a very critical moment. People need to make a lot of important decisions when it comes to retirement. They need to consider how to plan for their goals, their needs through the remainder of their life. So slide, please. So first of all, as retirement and as it grows ever closer, before that, we wanna just cover some basics. How much can you contribute or save toward your retirement? Now, it depends on where you're working, of course, whether you work, let's say, in a federal government setting. They might have a retirement process called FERS, F-E-R-S. They also have additional plans as well. So additional thrift savings plans are available to you if you're in the federal arena. Each state has their own tax deferred plan as well as other benefits and annuities. Private companies might have a 401k, for example. And then there's also the personal and individual Roth IRA or traditional IRA. These are all under the umbrella of retirement accounts. Each of them is a different type. The concept and purpose of them all is the same in that it is for you to save toward retirement. So now that we have that one goal in mind, how much can you contribute? Let's talk about that. 
Now, the majority of Americans usually use a 401k or a Roth IRA. IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. It's essentially private. It's not tied to any employer, independently based. For 2022, the limit on how much you're able to contribute is $6,000 to these types of accounts. The catch-up contribution is 1,000 if you are age 50 or older. Are there any questions or concerns about my visibility on the video? I see a few in the chat, I just wanna make sure. Oh, okay, I see your message, Darius, I will hold. Um, I will need the PowerPoint to work from. I can't see the PowerPoint on my side, just a moment. Just give me one moment. I'm trying to make sure that everyone is able to see both Stephen and the PowerPoint at the same time. So I'm gonna try and see if I can spotlight both of you. So just bear with me as I do so. Sure. Okay, just wanna make sure that everyone's able to see. Okay, but you could put me back. Uh, I'm not able to see myself. Okay. It's good on my end. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go through the slides again. If you could proceed to the next one. Uh, just go back one more. Excellent. So we were talking about the individual retirement accounts, <clears throat> the IRA. If you work for a company, you may contribute to a 401k. And it's 20,500 as the contribution limit for 2022. That's done by talking with human resources and deducting from payroll to save for those retirement purposes. They can assist you in setting that up. Now also tied in with that, when those contributions are made to your 401k, you may also have your own personal IRA account or a thrift savings plan, which is also called a TSP. That's only for federal employees. And for federal employees, they offer a 5% match. So if you contribute uh, money to that account, they will match a portion of your contribution up to 5%. So if you contribute 5% of your salary, they will match that entire 5%. I encourage people left and right to make sure that you take advantage of this matching. Because it's an automatic payroll deduction, it's a very easy way to save for retirement. So here are the numbers for 2022. Let's proceed to the next slide. So when you're thinking about deductions from payroll to put towards retirement, whether they be a TSP, a 401k, a 403b, or an IRA, an individual account of your own, once the money is in the account, what then happens is an investment. So an investment can be stocks, it could be bonds, it could be cash there's a variety of different investments available. So that's when you would just talk with your financial advisor to see how much funds you would put on each side. 
just checking in. Seems that people are saying they're not able to see the slides and the presenter. I want to make sure that everyone is able to see me all right. Okay, next slide. So first of all, how much you contribute and save for retirement is key. So if you have something like a mortgage, it's important that you try to accelerate those payments so the loan will be paid off. To curb new credit card debt, try paying cash for major purchases or limit new debt and reduce existing debt. Now, there is such a thing as good debt and bad debt. Something like a mortgage would be considered a good debt. A credit card though would be considered a bad debt. So we're gonna focus on talking about credit cards, credit reports, and minimizing the amount of debt you may have. If you can reduce the amount of mortgage that you have by the time you retire, as many people do, then they may decide to sell off their home that's already paid off. That's one option available to you that is quite nice. Now, number one here is credit cards. That is a bad debt that you wanna reduce as much as possible. And because that is a high interest, you'd like to pay that off first and then focus on the mortgage. So mortgage would be last on the list. Second would be a car note. And first would be credit cards because that interest charge tends to be the highest on credit cards and they may have rolling payments. So work on that, roll that over, and then once you're done, work on the mortgage. Some people may decide instead to take the money that they've invested in their home thus far and move to a different location after they sell that home. Next slide. So we talked about the mortgage, we talked about the car note. What about below the mortgage? Surely you are thinking, how much will I receive from Social Security? Especially in some cases, not, you know, not all, but for most Americans, Social Security is their top source of money during retirement. Second would be pension. If you have um, from the company that you worked for, some companies have no pensions, of course, Third would be an annuity from a 401k, a Roth IRA, a 403b, or a TSP, Thrift Savings Plan. And then the fourth one would be a source of savings. So here they are in order. So likely you're wondering, how much can I expect to receive? While you're earning, money in the workforce, you should expect that you will earn about 60% of that amount after retiring. That's where your goal should be. 60% of the salary you're earning while you are. 70% or 80%, it will also be a nice goal to estimate how much you would need during retirement, 70% or 80% of your current salary. And this simple math will help you decide how much you need to earn. And there's some explanation there based on the age that you plan to retire, whether it's how much money you have in savings, 4%, 4.3%, et cetera. And that will assist you in setting up that goal for how much you should save. You might be scared that it's a little too hard to catch up with this number, but I encourage you, it is never too late. So we wanna start with the good news. Half of the problem is solved because you are now looking at your financial picture, right? You don't know unless you know what the picture looks like. So by actually checking in and making sure you have time to develop a strategy to save. And you know, we know that the market is volatile, things change, but 90% of the time that 40% may last you the remainder of the years you have left. So you just need to keep that in mind. There's a lovely chart here 
60, 65, 70, 75. So the longer you can manage that, the later you can start your retirement, then the money will last even longer. So again, a good starting point is 4%. Now, if we can move on to the next slide. So like I have mentioned, often people think about whether or not they should retire earlier or later, and it truly is an individual decision. Some people want to retire early and that is okay. Some people love their work and decide to work longer. That's also okay. There's no magic age. The starting point is essentially 55 and above, but you really got to look at the numbers and you have to think through your options. At age 55, 60, 62, 65 are all regular ages for social security. 66, 67 even. Some start at 70. And they actually see a 32% increase in what they receive. But it depends on your health, your family dynamics, the specific needs of your situation. So there are so many factors at play that need to be considered. One important issue is you need to focus on your needs and not compare yourselves with others. Think about you, yourself, what your desires, your goals, your needs are to help guide your process so that you can have the best picture of what you should do to achieve your goal. Next slide. So we've talked about the income piece of retirement. But often your expenses are less when you think about transportation, you don't have a commute to work anymore, you're putting less miles on your car, spending less money on gas, you're not spending money eating lunch out. So these are expenses that you might not need in retirement. Often your house could be paid off and you're able to budget with less. However, there are some individuals who actually see an increase in expenses during retirement. Maybe they take a lot of big trips or traveling the world. That can lead to an increase in expenses. So again, generally speaking, most people can be comfortable with 60 to 70% of their pre-retirement income as long as their debts are paid off. Some people really want to, you know, live in style and spend a lot of money. Other people are more stay home with their grandchildren. So again, this is variable as well. So, so much is based on what your daily routines are as they tie to spending. And that will play out as you spend in retirement as well. Next slide. Now, anytime anyone talks about retirement, I always stop people and ask them about what their health planning will look like. They need to consider coverage for medical insurance, and this is truly key. Some people already have certain health issues, and so it's important that you pay attention to your specific conditions and think about the insurance coverage that you have so that you're not going to have to need to pay for extra insurance, or perhaps you will. You don't want to wait until you hit a certain age to get good health insurance because some companies will cover this, others won't. So there are so many variable situations when it comes to this health insurance situation. And it's important that you get the information before making a decision because some plans can be very costly. And sometimes people wonder about long-term care insurance and whether or not that is something that they should have. And this is what can help you if you end up needing nursing home assistance or other sorts of assistance like that. And so the important thing to think about 
is the earlier you purchase this sort of coverage, the cheaper it will be. So you have to think carefully in terms of figuring out what you may or may not need. Now, when you sit down with anyone who is good with money, like a financial advisor, make sure that you bring this issue up in your conversation with them. For more basic information about what sorts of insurance coverages and Medicare has, you can look at www.medicare.gov. And there is a lot of good information there that explains Medicare Part A, Part B, Part C, Part D, and the like. So that's a good starting point. You can also ask your employer about coverage and bring the, those information components together and have a conversation with your financial advisor about it. Next slide. This I mentioned previously about um, long-term care insurance. So that's the top part of this slide. Some companies actually offer health savings accounts or HSAs. And this is a really nice benefit. What it allows you to do is put pre-tax dollars aside. And then that money is in a special health savings account and you are not taxed on that money at any point. And you can use that to cover various health related coverages. Uh, it can cover your co-pays, prescription coverage, over the counter medications, lots of health related expenses, even the gym, uh, and so it's really nice to take advantage of those health savings accounts. And if you're not familiar with that, do ask your HR manager about that and whether HSAs are offered as part of your benefits. If HSAs are an option for you, then I suggest you think about your health needs and how much money makes sense to put in uh, so that you can take advantage of those tax savings for spending on those health related expenses. And then money also can grow tax-free there, compounding until you need it during retirement. Next slide. This brings me to the topic of lots of people have a couple things in mind when they retire. Where will they go? What will they do next? And where you live can make a big impact in your financial decisions. A large percent of money is spent on housing. And so you may choose not to live in a state that is expensive or has high property taxes. You may choose to move to a state that has lower taxes. Some states have no state tax, but other people make a decision uh, based on different reasons. Other people decide to stay because they wanna be close to family, children, grandchildren. Some have built a community where they are and love that community, but this is important information for you to consider as it can help you to plan for your retirement. If you're planning to move, you may decide to downsize your home. Now, some people decide to move because they want to pay off the debt on their house and be mortgage free. Some people consider the value of a home and they might choose to move to a similarly sized home that is half the price. So these are all considerations as people get close to retirement, thinking about where you will live. Next slide. So I see we're almost at 730 and I do want to make sure that uh, I'm doing well on time. As we talk about retirement, I also think it's important to think uh, what I have seen in my experience working with different people. Before people retire, it's good to have a clear picture of what you want and to think about where you will shift your energies. Maybe you'll work in a different work job, maybe you'll engage in some additional hobbies, maybe you want to travel. It can be helpful to have that sort of vision for retirement 
that will also be part of your happiness. Have something in your plan there that brings you joy. There are some people who retire without a plan and that can often lead to some level of depression because work has become your home and so not every retirement is a celebration. Some people would rather continue working. Other people retire and then them find themselves unsure of where they're going next. So I encourage you to think seriously about what retirement will mean and look like for you. You know, what's the rationale for retiring? What new hobby might you develop? Perhaps you would like to do some travel that you didn't have the time for earlier in life. Some people like the routine that comes from work. And so people have a variety of situations, but people with hobbies typically retire, enjoy retirement more than those without. And if you don't have one, you can find one. Uh, pickleball is a popular one example uh, that can be good for people. So that was something important that I thought was worth mentioning. A lot of people also, when they retire, think about their will, their estate, their children, and it's almost a wake up call for them that they are of a certain age that they're going to need help. And so, take a year or two to really settle in so that you can see things clearly and i say take a year or two because it's going to take you that much time to get a sense of what taxes look like pre and post retirement if you move that's going to be an adjustment so you really want to get settled into retirement life you know give yourself that time and flexibility to really settle in and then at that point, move forward with your new life. You know, be yourself. The other thing I like to mention about is when people retire, they have this sense of thinking back, how do I wanna be remembered? What am I gonna leave behind? And that's a good question to think about. You know, it's not all about money. I know the font might be small here on this slide, but 69% of Americans say that it's memories shared with loved ones and different events that they most want to be remembered for so it's really about the friends the family those connections that they've made that's what people most remember it's not the stuff it's those experiences that's 69 percent of americans 87 percent of americans believe that it is parents responsibility to start a dialogue with their children about their legacy because often children don't know what parents' wishes are. And so it's important for parents to take that time, take that step, sit down, have a conversation with your children and talk about what you'll want in those final years of your life. That way the children will feel less burdened and unsure about what to do. So the communication piece is truly key there again so that it's clear to everyone involved what those desires are 43 percent of americans believe that having their affairs in order and when i say affairs in order i'm talking about power of attorney will uh, the ability to make financial and medical decisions for another individual what their last wishes are all of these are important components again on having that clarity so as to not become a burden to one's children or loved ones. If a person becomes very sick, very ill, and others might not be sure, you know, what should we do? Uh, is this a DNR situation? Do we go, move forward? It can be really challenging if you don't know what your parent wants in that situation. So the communication keys, again, is key. And only 18% of Americans actually have a will. A lot of people say they have one, but they don't actually clearly have one. And this is okay. Um, I don't want anyone to feel embarrassed about this because a lot of people haven't gotten there. But it is a good idea to start having that conversation, start documenting it. 
you know, some people prefer to do it on their own, and at least that's something. But what I would recommend, uh, especially when there are complex family dynamics, is to have a lawyer work that out for you. It's a good thing to keep in mind for everyone, truly. I mentioned again the power of attorney to take care of medical or financial situations for a loved one. Now, 65% of Americans say that they would prefer to distribute at least part of their estate while they are still alive to their loved ones. And that can be money, but it's not only to their children. You know, it might be certain donations. Um, it might be setting up a state endowment. I mean, there's a variety of examples for what that could look like. For Gallaudet alumni, a perfect example would be that some people would like to set up an endowment in honor or in memory of their name or a program that they strongly believe in to support future students who are going to college. That could be a scholarship. And so then people can see the impact and feel proud of that while they're alive rather than waiting until after they're gone. So some people do this while they're still alive. Other people uh, decide that they want to share with their friends, with their families, nieces, nephews, children, whatever the case may be, so they can see those gifts that are planned earlier in retirement. One common example is helping with down payments on a home. And that way, the children can start building their wealth. You know, endowment is another way, you know, setting up people to have success with whatever they dream of doing. You know, keep the joy of giving going. What you need to know about your will, well, <laughs> there's a lot there. I think that really needs a whole other presentation to get all of the details of wills out there. I just think it's important for me to mention what I see and wills actually solve a lot of issues. And if you don't have a will, try to make sure you at least fill out who your beneficiaries are for every account that you have. That is something you can do now. And that means with your bank, with any investments you have, with your retirement accounts, make sure you have those beneficiaries documented. That's a really important point. And then the last bullet point here is another question. Should you give your kids an early inheritance? Like I mentioned, some people help their children to buy homes. And that is another way of growing assets. There are other people who will help with grandchildren's college education, and they will be thrilled to receive that money to help them go to college. That's another common thing that takes place. Um, college funds for grandchildren is another big thing we see. I'm not sure, let's go to the next slide. So I'll give you just a minute if you'd like to take down any of these resources for additional important information that would be worth checking out. The first one is medicare.gov. Again, information about health insurance is there. The next website is information about social security benefits and retirement. You can request a copy of your current status as well as the history of your income. So that's an important thing to check. And you can get online, use your PIN number, look at the history and all of that. The third bullet point here is for people who would like to learn more about finances. Um, this Khan Academy has a great reputation it's actually a nonprofit organization 
that focuses on financial information about a variety of topics. So one might be how interest works. Another might be how to take out loans. Another might be information about stocks and bonds and how all of those work. So there's a lot of great information um, and they keep things pretty simple. You know, they're these two to four minute videos um, and they have graphics as part of them. So they're a really nice resource for you to look at and they are captioned as well. I know that some people prefer information in American Sign Language. And there are some videos out there on YouTube that actually do have signing in American Sign Language explaining financial information. So I have the National Disability Institute listed there. And these are four great resources for you for to start learning more and more about the information for your retirement planning. So those are resources for you. Yeah, maybe we can also send those out in an email as well. Okay, next slide. I think I'm done. Okay, so I want to thank everyone. Great. Wow. What a wealth of information you've provided with us. So we really appreciate that. It's always interesting, you know, because I'm sure for myself, maybe for a lot of us, actually, there's a range of ages thinking that retirement is much later or, oh, I'll take care of a will down the road. But it's always better uh, to start sooner rather than later, especially when it comes to retirement. So the earlier you start, the better situation you'll be in. So, you know, there are really some good things to take note of. And I'm glad that you mentioned it about starting earlier. And you're absolutely right. Earlier is always better because it will be compounding. As that interest grows your investments even more. So the earlier that you start, it's going to compound and increase. You will really see a big difference as time starts to go by. So I always encourage people, Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one hundred and twenty-eight, three hundred and sixty-four, three hundred and fifty-six. Excuse me. So think about how things will compound up the curve. Great, thank you. Um, we will shift over to the Q and A section, and I do want to emphasize. I want to apologize earlier. I know that some people were having difficulties seeing both the presenter and the PowerPoint. So I hope that this experience was okay for everyone. Um, again, the PowerPoint and the video recording will both be distributed to alumni, so I wanted to let you know about that, and um, if you have any questions, do use that Q&A button, and what I will do is share some of the questions that we have already received. So upon retiring, um, is it possible to still get a Roth IRA when you're no longer working? So Roth is essentially a tax-free savings plan for retirement, which is why it is such a great thing. But this is something that you do while you're earning money. As you earn money, you pay taxes, the money is taken out of your paycheck. From the net amount, you put that money into a Roth IRA. So you've already put money into it. You've already taken the taxes out, you put up to 6,000 in, and then it's tax-free forever. What you could do is you could also contribute while you're still working. Once you've retired, you can withdraw the money from that account tax-free. That is one big pro about the Roth IRA model. It's a little bit different from the traditional ones. The traditional ones use pre-tax monies. So you essentially contribute from the gross, not the net. Taxes are paid from your payroll after that contribution is put into a 401k, for example. So they're essentially called tax deferred. Hopefully that's clear. Great. The next question is, what is the best way to reinvest 
unused RMD. So RMD required distribution Now, RMD specifically, because it's required, uh, the retirement account, the, R the RMD, and now the retirement account might be an IRA or a 401k, that is tax deferred. So you're not paying taxes on that. You're just letting the money accumulate and you haven't paid taxes. Distributions, which is what RMD stands for, required minimum distributions. When you take money out of the account, it's called a distribution. That's from age 59 and a half to age 72 that you can begin withdrawing the funds. Once you hit 72, however, you are required to take some out by the law. And that's based upon a certain formula every year that you have to remove a certain amount from that account, that required minimum distribution. And it's required for a period of years. If it's money that you might not need, you still have to take it out, pay the taxes on it. And then you could put that money into a regular account, for example, continue investing that money in something else perhaps a regular savings account or some other type of account if you don't need the funds at that time. So you can continue investing it. So when I ask a question, I'm gonna turn my video off so that you'll be full screen moving forward. The next question is, can deaf people retire with full benefits at age 62? Because my state keeps telling me that, but I thought the age was 65. So how does that work? So that has to do with social security. Now, um, I'm not in the right place to give you all of these details at the moment, but um, I'm just a, you know, a regular average person who is 62, let's say, and I start taking social security. My um, distribution, the amount I get is going to be less. And it's based on a certain age requ requirement that you have to meet determined by social security. There's either a reduced amount or a regular amount. So you, if you wait until age 70, some people are retiring earlier and realize that if they use social security, they may use social security disability. In other words, they're not actually retiring they're leaving the workforce because of a disability. And that's something that you perhaps would wanna ask your social security office about to make sure you get an accurate detail about what can and what cannot be done. If you decide to do social security at an earlier age, you need to ask if you're eligible for SSDI as well. It could happen, it's, it's not as common, but I wanna make sure that you get accurate information before you decide to retire. Okay, so the next question is, for people who really enjoy working and plan to work for a long time, let's say till they're 75, what should their retirement portfolio look like for that group of people? Okay, so I know many people who wanna continue working even to 75. And if you're asking about the portfolio, it really depends on the needs that you expect to have. If you don't need to depend on investments, perhaps you're just going to do your everyday routine. Um, you could let your investments be a little bit more aggressive or risky so you can make it balanced. So all of that to say, definitely take social security. Absolutely. Once you hit 70, use that plus any other ones you're required to start on an RMD. So the full picture is that 
Some may elevate your taxes, some may not, but try to focus on the ones that have the higher growth market and those that will reduce your tax um, liability. So you should be watching your portfolio to make sure that it continues to work for you while you are working. Let me just scan over the questions that we have received. Okay, the next question, how important is life insurance in your opinion? In some cases, it seems very profitable to the company, but not truly to the client. So what are your personal thoughts on that matter? One of the most often asked questions is actually about life insurance. So there are two different sides. The purpose of life insurance is essentially to cover a loss, right? It's covering a loss, that's insurance. Perhaps the family has children who are young and the spouse, one of them stays home. So they're one income household. And when that income, that person who earns the money is lost, Life insurance will help them carry through that challenging time with the young family. Another possible situation, let's say you don't have any debt, you're in a very comfortable financial position, a challenging time might arise, perhaps you haven't run into anything. One good example would be you purchase a car insurance policy for liability or the loss of a vehicle. And that's called a term to give you peace of mind so that you have continued coverage. And in some ways that may be necessary, in some ways it may not be necessary. Insurance is not necessarily for everyone. It depends on the needs of the individual. Yeah, we have a lot more questions. So I'm just gonna select a few with the time we have left. One is, is it possible to retire early and to live off of your 401k and then later take SSI when you were age 70? Does that make sense as a situation? Well, the answer would be yes, that's something you could do. But again, that financial planning piece is what you really need to set up, which is having an outlook of some kind. Playing with the numbers would help me in giving you the best answer. If you continue your 401k and defer starting social security, one could be beneficial, the other could be beneficial. We have to look at your total tax liabilities, what tax bracket you fall into, your total income, any possible predicted expenses later on, also any um, interest that you're earning on investments and your health and any health concerns you may have. So sitting down with a financial planner is going to be the best strategy for you. Great. An interesting and timely question we have right now. There is currently a war in Ukraine. Is that impacting people's investments? Uh, I expected that question <laughs> would come up. So the current set situation right now in the Ukraine, uh, the war occurring there is just terrible and how it affects the economy and the people there and here. So American companies are these top 500 companies. Um, are doing less than 1% of business with Russia, less than 1%. So when we talk about the actual impact of these businesses and the sales, there's not a significant impact. The more challenging piece, however, is the cost of oil, gasoline, and the relevant inflation that's occurring right now in this challenging time. It's a painful time right now. There are a lot of companies that are struggling to adjust and manage to remain profitable and also deal with the cost of living 
rising so quickly. We also are having some, we've, you know, we've had some rough times the past few weeks. And from my experience, um, things do tend to smooth out later. So when you think about selling, buying, moving stocks, moving investments, take a look at it and rebalance your portfolio if necessary. It might be a good opportunity to invest in some other things that have come up in that time since the last time you reviewed it and view the negative and positive impact that's possible because both are always possible, but you can rebalance your portfolio in the meantime. Thank you. I think we're down to probably our last three questions. Can you share your thoughts on keeping your TSP or rolling over your TSP to a private company after retirement and what your thoughts are there? Oh, that is a very important question. The Thrift Savings Plan or TSP is one of the best and least expensive options for saving for retirement. I mean, it costs nearly nothing to the person to have it. And you'll be very glad that you've put money into your TSP. Rollovers can be good as well. Um, it depends greatly on the situation. Now, there are a variety of, of different investment opportunities. The TSP list, we know those investment opportunities are more limited. So if you want to roll it over into one where you're more flexible in how you can apply those investments, there are pros and cons on both sides. Also, you can access the money from a account that you've rolled it over into a little bit easier than a TSP. But what I recommend you ask is what are the costs involved if you do roll it over into another account? Because you will see the number and then the total cost involved and then compare that with the TSP to assist you in making the best decision and knowing which one is better for your situation. One of the common reasons people roll over is the flexibility of access to the funds and also being able to check in. But you have to know the costs involved. But there's a lot more pros and cons. Um, also annuities as well is another piece of that. Thank you. So the person here says that they are retired, but are still paying federal and state taxes on their pension. And people told me that I should only be paying federal taxes. However, I'm paying both. So can you clarify what's actually necessary there? So pensions are like a paycheck, right? So you do pay federal, some states, do not require you to pay state taxes. It depends greatly on where you live. So some, you will have to pay taxes on a pension depending on the state. Federal always will be deducted from a pension though. Federal taxes always must be paid. Thank you. Okay. So the question here is for retirees, what is the maximum salary that can be earned in order to avoid paying taxes within the United States? For example, in Canada, retirees are allowed to earn 75,000 Canadian dollars a year and still don't have to pay taxes. So what does that look like in the United States or for Americans only? When it comes to income and taxes, it greatly depends on the bracket that you fall into. Uh, when you retire, uh, you have to think about how much you're getting, plus uh, you get from your accounts, plus the age. And there's no salary limit, but you will always have to pay some taxes. You have to look at the total picture of all the income that you will be receiving and where that puts you as far as which tax bracket, 10, 15, 24, 32%. So you need to look at the tax bracket from the IRS.
Okay, this is our final question. And I think it's a pretty general question. If I want to prepare myself before retirement, who is the best person I can see to help review my portfolio? And you can contact any financial advisor would be my answer. Email and ask, you can contact me definitely. Um, and I can also recommend who to contact depending on your situation. Generally speaking, financial advisors like myself can assist with this. Well, really, so many people have so many questions, but unfortunately, time has gotten away from us. And I know that information like this is truly valuable, especially provided in American Sign Language, because it does not happen often. And so people do have a lot of questions. But like I said, we are out of time. So I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Leibach, for being with us today as one of the alumnus uh, to spend this hour of your time tonight. Um, and hopefully people learn something that they will carry with them. And these types of conversations are much needed within our community, this transparency and sharing of information. Stephen, do you have any final words? I do. First of all, I do wanna thank the Alumni House specifically for giving me the opportunity, the platform to share my learned experience, you know, from birth to death, from womb to tomb, as they say, we have this lived experience. And I'm glad that Gallaudet can provide a service to the community like us, the alumni, to continue learning from start of our life to finish of our life. So that's very beneficial. And I'm so glad to be a member of the GUAA. And I'm so proud of all of you for hosting an event like this. Okay, well, again, um, I just wanna share with this that this recording will be shared out with alumni as well as the PowerPoint. And again, I want to say to everyone, have a fabulous evening and take care of yourselves. Stephen, good night and thank you. Thank you. You have a great night. Good night, everyone.